Classical Liberal Arts Academy was and is the only place where Catholic children can study the subjects and courses that were studied and taught by the saints throughout world history. The modern school curriculum is the product of an abandonment of Christian learning. The modern K-12 curriculum, if your children are studying a curriculum and the focus of that curriculum is math and science and English language arts and social studies, that curriculum, I'm going to be very clear here, that curriculum is not a curriculum that was ever studied or taught by any of the saints that you're going to teach your children about. You're going to talk about saints and then do something in the education of your children that no saints ever did or ever taught you to do as a Catholic parent. You're going to tell your children about saints and then you're not going to imitate their study and teaching. And that is the true cause of the problems in modern Catholic education. If we look back through world history, through the entire history of the church, there was one curriculum that was studied and taught by the saints. You need to listen clearly to this. Throughout all of Catholic church history, there was one curriculum that was studied and taught by the saints. It was the classical liberal arts curriculum. If you go back to the apostles, the educated apostles, like St. Paul, St. Luke, who is Paul's companion, who accompanied him on his missionary journeys, those were men educated in the classical liberal arts. When we look to the early church fathers, St. Jerome, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, those men studied and taught the classical liberal arts. That was their system of education. In fact, St. Augustine wrote that if a man came to the church seeking baptism, if he had a classical liberal arts education, he did not need to go through the normal initiation process because a man who had studied the classical liberal arts could be trusted to be sincere in his interest in Christianity. That's how highly respected students of the classical liberal arts were in the time of the church fathers. All of the church fathers had this in common. When they were given an education, they were taught the classical liberal arts. They were not taught the modern science courses in modern schools. They were not taught modern mathematics courses. Their education did not focus on learning to write and read in their own native language, even though that's important, of course. Their education was not focused on secular literature. 
their education was focused on the classical liberal arts. If we do not teach our children the classical liberal arts and focus their education on the classical liberal arts, we cannot expect the results of the education that was enjoyed by the saints we talk about. And I'm going to repeat that again. If we don't teach our children the classical liberal arts, we cannot expect that they will have the wisdom we find in the saints. There is only one curriculum in the history of the Catholic Church that was studied and taught by saints. And that curriculum is the classical liberal arts. There's only one. Now, if you move from the time of the Church Fathers, we could say, oh yes, well, they were converted to Christianity from pagan backgrounds. And that's why they studied the classical liberal arts, because that was the ancient system of education in Greece and Rome. And then they converted to Christianity. So in future generations, a new Christian education would have developed. And that would be true Christian education. Well, we can trace the education of Christian schools and schoolmasters, the education that was studied and taught by the saints through all the Middle Ages. We can find all the saints from Boethius to St. Albert the Great, St. Dominic, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, all the way through to the time of the Protestant Reformation. And guess what? There remained only one system of education, and that was the classical liberal arts. So through medieval times, again, all of the saints that you can name, if any of the saints was ever given an education or ever gave others an education, that education was an education in the classical liberal arts. St. Augustine writes about it in the time of the Church Fathers. Boethius devoted his life to translating the works of Aristotle for the sake of Christian education in the 6th century. And then the famous Dominican saints, St. Dominic, St. Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas, and the rest, explicitly studied and taught the classical liberal arts. The University of Paris, which was the greatest university in medieval Europe, taught the classical liberal arts. At Oxford University, the classical liberal arts were carved in images into the buildings at Oxford University. There was only one curriculum in all of early Christian history and of, in all of medieval Christian history. Through the 1500s, name any saint. He studied and taught the classical liberal arts. We can make exceptions, of course, for humble saints who lived by a simple faith, who became religious and served God within 
the protection of religious communities. We can make an example like St. Francis and say, well, St. Francis was one of the most famous saints of all, and he didn't make much of education. And there's two important things to note about St. Francis. First of all, if we look to the education that Francis did receive, we'll find that it was a classical liberal arts education. And second, Francis's life was a life devoted to a specific charism and apostolate, which for him and his early Franciscan brothers was not focused on education. So it would make no sense for us to look to St. Francis for guidance in education. However, if we follow the history of the Franciscans and look at some of its most famous members, we find St. Anthony, we find St. Bonaventure, and in these Franciscans, we find extraordinary learning, and we find that these men studied and taught the classical liberal arts. So we have to make an exception for St. Francis, but the exception is that he wasn't focused on learning, he was focused on a different charism, a different grace, a different mission within the broader mission of the Christian church. And yet his followers, his most famous and holiest followers, were students and teachers of the classical liberal arts. And I mentioned two of the most famous, St. Anthony and St. Bonaventure. In fact, if it wasn't for Thomas Aquinas being so famous, St. Bonaventure would be known as one of the greatest scholars and wise men in the history of the Catholic Church. The problem for St. Bonaventure was that he lived at the same time as Thomas Aquinas Thomas Aquinas simply outshone him and covered up the amazing learning of St. Bonaventure. St. Thomas Aquinas is called the angelic doctor, and St. Bonaventure is called the seraphic doctor. But St. Bonaventure gets hidden because of the brightness of St. Thomas. And again, the reason why St. Thomas is so famous is because of his extraordinary mastery of the classical liberal arts. As we move through medieval history, we find the classical liberal arts curriculum so widely established as the only true curriculum that it's painted on the walls of monasteries. It's illustrated in medieval books. Famous painters take up the illustration of the seven liberal arts as the theme of many paintings and sculptures. There's nothing else but the classical liberal arts. And the reason why there's no other curriculum other than the classical liberal arts is very simple to understand. There can be no other curriculum. There is no other curriculum. There's the classical liberal arts curriculum and nothing else except for errors, for education that no longer aims at the true end of man. Once we abandon the classical liberal arts, we're no longer seeking the end of man or the glory of God. 
We're just seeking worldly concerns. We're seeking financial gain and so on. And we've turned away from wisdom and from the true end of Catholic education. The great challenge to the classical liberal arts curriculum came at the time when the modern world emerged and all hell broke loose in Europe. The classical liberal arts were established as the only acceptable education for Christian people until the time in history when all of Catholicism was rebelled against. We have the Renaissance, when the true Catholic classical learning was abandoned for pagan Greek and Roman culture and literature. Europeans argued that Catholicism was the opponent of all happiness. This is why the Middle Ages, dominated by Catholicism, are called the Dark Ages by modern historians. They were dark because the foolishness of the world, worldly pursuits, worldly ambitions, all of the things that men love to boast of and pursue for their own pleasure and carnal indulgence were darkened and snuffed out by the holy and wise Catholic culture and learning of the Middle Ages. And so for worldly people, the Middle Ages were like the Dark Ages. Yet the reality is that the reason why the world hates the Middle Ages is because they were, in fact, the golden age of human culture. When Catholicism had not only filled much of Europe, but controlled the culture and education of Europe. To the world, it was the Dark Age. To good and holy people, it was a golden age. And the rebellion against that Catholic culture came in a couple of different attacks or on a couple of different fronts. First, the culture itself was attacked. The Catholic culture that had been established by the success and power of the Catholic Church was attacked. And as I said, the Renaissance was a rebirth of pagan culture, a rebirth of pre-Christian Greco-Roman culture, culture of Europe before the continent was evangelized and sanctified by the Catholic Church. That's what the Renaissance is. The people who refer to the Renaissance as a time of rebirth are the same people who refer to the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages. It was a rebirth of pre-Christian European culture, a return to a focus on Greek and Roman civilization, not as it was sanctified by Christianity, but before it was sanctified by Christianity. That's the Renaissance, an attack on true Catholic culture. The second attack of this period was the Reformation, Protestant schism. As the Renaissance forces attacked and sought to overthrow the influence of Catholic philosophy, the Reformation 
sought to attack and overthrow the influence of scholastic theology. The teaching that's known most famously from the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. The Protestant Reformation is a rebellion against scholastic theology. It's a rebellion against church authority. It's a rebellion against the whole idea that Christ created a church on earth and established a hierarchy through which he governs the church and to which all Christians are subject. The Protestant Reformation, or schism, was a rebellion against church authority and against scholastic theology. A third attack came upon the method of learning. The third attack came upon the method of learning. The classical liberal arts were so firmly established and the stranglehold that Catholic philosophy had on all heresies and errors was so strong that there was no way for the Catholic philosophy or theology to be attacked by means of reasoning. As long as reasoning was the method by which truth was demonstrated, nothing could ever be raised against the Catholic faith, against Christian philosophy, scholastic theology. You can see paintings of what's called the Triumph of St. Thomas Aquinas. And I recommend you Google the Triumph of St. Thomas Aquinas because a number of paintings were produced that show, to personify or to create an illustration of the reality of what happened in world philosophy, St. Thomas is shown seated on a throne with all of the heretics and false teachers of the world under his feet. And this is called the triumph of St. Thomas Aquinas. But it represents a, a, a greater reality that Catholic philosophy and theology had defeated all of its enemies and sat over them with its feet upon the necks of all of the false teachers. And this system of learning, which had triumphed over the world, was the classical liberal arts and scholastic philosophy. The relationship between the two is that scholastic philosophy employs the method of learning that's studied and taught in the classical liberal arts. As long as that system of learning, as long as reasoning was the method by which doctrines were tested and defended, no one had any chance to resist the power of the Catholic faith. And so the third attack on true Christianity, on, on Catholic Christianity. The third attack came through a, re a rebellion against the method of learning. And we find this in the promotion of what was called the scientific, or what is called today the scientific method. But in the days when it was founded, it was not called the scientific method, for that's really not what it is. It was called the new method. The method that if it could be installed in schools and communities, would allow 
the enemies of the Catholic faith to overthrow the stranglehold and power that Catholicism had on the world at that time. The scientific method or the new method was presented as the means by which the world, with all of its false teachers and heretics, could overthrow the triumph of St. Thomas Aquinas. Francis Bacon, writing in the 1600s, called for a complete reset. In modern political circles, we hear talk about the Great Reset as an economic movement to try and bring communist ideas into world government. We, talk, we hear about the Great Reset. Well, the true Great Reset took place in the 1600s. What we're seeing today is simply the outworking or the globalization of what was already accomplished by Francis Bacon in the 1600s. Francis Bacon proposed that all human learning be directed no longer by reasoning in the light of divine revelation or church authority or the authority of the ancient philosophers, but that all of that former learning be thrown away, as it were, and that human knowledge be reset. And the means by which human learning would be reset in the 1600s was by a change in the method by which knowledge was sought. The scholastic method, or the Socratic method, of the ancient and medieval world was to be thrown away and abandoned. And what was to be put in its place was experimental physical science. Experimental physical science was to be put in the place of the scholastic method, also known as the Socratic method, which had its actual form in the study and teaching of the classical liberal arts. That system of education needed to be replaced if the enemies of Catholicism, of the gospel of Jesus Christ could ever free themselves from the triumph of St. Thomas Aquinas. The method of learning would have to be changed because reasoning was the cause of the downfall of the religions and philosophies of the world. And therefore, as long as reasoning was the focus of schooling, as long as dialectical reasoning and demonstrative reasoning were taught in school, as long as children were exercised in disputations where they examined controversial questions and subjected them to the tests of the art of reasoning, anti-Christian ideas had no chance. But if that method could be changed, then anything was possible. And that grip of medieval Catholicism could be broken and all hell break loose again, which is what these men desired. They wanted to be freed from what they called the Dark Age to a new world order, to a new world, a great reset, as it were, a renaissance, a return to the good old days before Christianity took over. And so starting in the 1600s, 
the enemies of Catholicism no longer debated with the Catholics. We see in the example of Martin Luther that there was no hope of debating with the Catholics. We see in the example of Galileo that there was no hope in debating the Catholics. The idea is that these modern men wanted to push forward on society ideas that had no root in Catholic tradition or in ancient tradition also had no proof. And therefore, if the ideas were only to be received when they were demonstrated to be true, these new ideas, these anti-Christian ideas, had no chance. And so the method had to change. And in the 1600s, we see the beginning of the change of the method. And the place where that change happens is in education. For the first time in the history of the world, classical liberal arts were abandoned. Little by little, of course, because this change was subtle and very strategic. Classical liberal arts were little by little removed from the schools and the universities and replaced by new sciences and subjects that served the new method. Before this time, if one went to a, a school or university, he found the seven liberal arts. He found classical philosophy, which means moral philosophy or ethics, natural philosophy or physics, and first philosophy or metaphysics. And the theology taught was the study of sacred scripture and the writings of the church fathers and of Thomas Aquinas. These were the sources of all Christian learning, from the first lessons in the classical liberal arts in grammar and classical arithmetic, all the way up through the highest lessons in sacred scripture and scholastic theology. That system of education was firmly established for hundreds of years in the European schools, and the changes began by changing the curriculum of the schools. And we can begin to trace the changes in the 1600s, even in the 1500s. So the Protestants were really just one part of this attack on Catholicism, on wisdom itself, on ancient learning. Protestants started this by promoting studies among the common people, and it's presented to us as some sort of virtuous, noble thing, that the common people were encouraged to read the Bible and so on, but that's not the truth of what the Protestants taught. What the Protestants taught was not so innocent as, hey, everyone should read the Bible for themselves. What the Protestants taught the people was, everyone is free to interpret the Bible for themselves. And there's no need for any submission of your faith or practical life to the authority of the church. That's what's really being taught when people are encouraged to quote-unquote read the Bible for themselves. Any Catholic is welcome to read the Bible, but when it comes time to answer the question, what does this mean, and how should we practice this? We must submit to church authority in those questions of faith and morals. That's the authority given by Christ to the hierarchical church. That's what was under attack when the Protestants promoted 
publication of Bibles in the common language. And again, the only way for the Bible to get into the common language was first for some Protestant to interpret and turn it into the common language. And that's why the church opposed this idea of publishing Bibles. Not because the church was concerned that people would learn the scriptures, but because of how the people were being encouraged to learn the scriptures. With the scriptures separated from the context of classical liberal arts education, of true philosophy and established Catholic theology. That's what was fought against by the church. And in the schools, the same thing took place. The study of ancient philosophy was abandoned and replaced by experimental science. Now, in modern circles, we've all been so conditioned to accept this idea of scientific research as some sort of good, innocent pursuit of knowledge, of solutions to the world's problems, and so on, that almost every Christian school you can name, even Christian homeschools, homeschool publishers, every Christian education program that you know of exalts modern natural sciences and mathematics as if they're some sort of innocent, good study by which we come to learn about God and the created world. And that's how modern science is packaged to Christians as the study of creation. And therefore, because we're studying creation by means of experiments, and we're studying mathematics because in mathematics we find the laws of nature those ideas are the ideas of the anti-Catholic movement of the Renaissance, Reformation, and Scientific Revolution. That's the subtlety of the attack. What's so subtle about the attack is that it can be presented in Christian terms to the Christian people. If you look at a modern Catholic school curriculum, and that includes a modern homeschool curriculum, you can look at the Seton Catholic homeschool curriculum, which is the most popular and is celebrated by everyone to be a true, faithful Catholic curriculum. If you look at the curriculum, you will find that the studies of the saints, the classical liberal arts, classical philosophy, Catholic theology, are actually not present. Of course, there's a shadow of them that remains, because we know that we can't abandon everything completely but if you look at the curriculum, if you look at the list of subjects and ask the simple question, is this the curriculum? Is this the list of subjects? Are these the kinds of books that the saints pictured on the books, studied and taught? Or is this some different system of learning that none of the saints had anything to do with. And if it's different, which it is, it's completely different, if it's different, why are the pictures of the saints on these books as if these are their subjects? Why is Thomas Aquinas pictured on the book when the educational system of Thomas Aquinas is rejected in this curriculum? Why are images of medieval saints pictured on these science and math books 
when this curriculum is the curriculum that rebels against the quote-unquote dark ages of medieval Catholic learning. Why is this education, why is this modern K-12 math and science education based on the scientific method being presented to children as if this is the education of the saints through the history of the church? The answer is because this is the deception of the modern method. This is the subtlety and cunning of this modern deception, why it's so powerful. This modern rebellion against Catholic learning, against the classical liberal arts, against scholastic philosophy, is so deceptive because it can be presented to Christians in their own languages, in their own terms, with their own phrases. Look at how we have modern Catholics pretending that the book of Genesis teaches that the world was created through evolution when the words of Genesis cannot possibly express anything more to the contrary of that idea. And yet somehow this scientific method can lead Christians to imagine that their religion teaches the message of this modern, naturalistic, anti-Catholic, scientific method that was established by the people who worked to overthrow Catholic culture in Europe in the 1600s. That's how deceptive this is. When we look and we see that after several hundred years, even though children have been in Catholic schools, they have been in Catholic home schools, there's been all this work in Catholic education, why are there no religious vocations? Why are there no religious vocations? Why is no one interested in becoming a monk? Why is no one interested in becoming a priest? Why is no one interested in becoming a nun? Why are there no religious vocations, even though there's so much quote-unquote Catholic education? Even among families who, by homeschooling, imagine that they're going to quote-unquote raise saints. Why isn't it working? The reason is because the religious vocations that we think of in the Middle Ages were the result of the classical liberal arts. The abundance of vocations, the interest in priestly ministry, the interest in the contemplative life was the result of a classical liberal arts education that led students to understand the method of truth-seeking, to understand the value of true scholastic philosophy and theology, and showed them that a life devoted to wisdom was the highest and best and happiest life possible for human beings on earth. The Church has explicitly taught in the Council of Trent, that if anyone suggests that married life is equal to or better than virginity for the kingdom of God, or than celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of God, let him be anathema. And yet we find people saying exactly this in modern Catholic circles, and the reason why they're saying it is because some justification has to be made for why there's no interest in religious vocations. We have to now teach that marriage and family life is just as good 
as religious life. Why are we teaching this? Because the consequences and the results of this modern education, even if we call it Catholic, are not Catholic results. They're not the results that came from the classical liberal arts education of the Middle Ages and of the ancient world. Even in the ancient world, before Christianity, the classical liberal arts led men to want to be philosophers. We look at men like Socrates, Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, Seneca, Cicero, and we find men who wanted to separate themselves from worldly pursuits and devote themselves to the full-time study of wisdom. The contemplative life was a result of a good education. When that education taught the classical liberal arts, preparing students for the right understanding of true philosophy and for faith in divine revelation. We have abandoned that system of education. We have taken up the educational system founded upon the new method, the anti-Catholic method. And what we have in 2021 are the same results in Catholic circles as the world has in their circles because we are giving our children the same education. We're teaching our children to think with this anti-Catholic, naturalist, scientific mindset. It starts in elementary school. The children are taught in first grade to focus on math, to study, to study the natural world, not by studying natural philosophy, not by studying the Bible and learning to understand the natural world through philosophy, through divine revelation. They're taught to go out and experiment. Go out and collect the bugs, collect the leaves, watch the National Geographic shows where we go and explore everything as if the natural world could ever be understood by the study of individual things in it. This is the whole point of the scientific method and how it leads people to the rejection of Catholic truth. Ancient learning started with the universal truths. Universal truths about the character of God, about the purpose for the created world, about the nature of man. Socrates taught, know thyself. That's where learning starts. It starts with the knowledge of human nature. It starts with the knowledge of God himself and that God created man in his own image and that the whole entire created world was designed for man by God. That man named the animals in the Garden of Eden. That he was the master of all of nature, and all of the created world existed for the glory of God and for the good of man, and that man's job in this world was to tend the ground and keep it, to direct all of the affairs on earth to the service of the will of God, to the glory of God. Ancient learning started with God and with the nature of man. That's why the first of Plato's dialogues that are to be studied is First Alcibiades, because the topic of discussion in First Alcibiades is what is man. That's where it all starts. We learn the concept of what it means to know thyself, to understand that you are a man made of body and soul, created in the image and likeness of God. And in light of that knowledge, you're now to look at the world and understand it in light of this transcendent truth which enlightens and explains all things. And we, we learn by applying universal truths 
to individual examples. And that's the art of reasoning. We, everything we meet, if we find something and we look at it and we ask, what is this? We don't start from the individual thing and work up to a general answer. We start from the universal truth and work down to the answer. That's wisdom. That's knowledge according to the old method. The new method tells us, no, no, no. We don't start with assumptions or beliefs or traditions. We don't start with universals. We just pick up the thing itself. We say, what is this? And we describe the thing that we're looking at, and that's all that we can know about it. And we do that with every individual thing we find. And we limit our knowledge to individuals. Children are being taught that in kindergarten classes, in Christian schools. They're being taught to think like pagans. Not the good pagans. Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates were pagans. They're not being taught to think like the wise pagans. They're being taught to think like the fools in ancient society, whom the wise pagans worked to fight against in order to improve human life. This is true in every Catholic school. This is true in every Catholic homeschool. Every Catholic homeschool program focuses on math and science. They pretend that there's some kind of Catholic biology course and Catholic chemistry course. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Did St. Thomas Aquinas ever study or teach or try to discover anything like biology or chemistry? Did any wise man in Catholic history ever suggest that math was the explanation for everything that happens in the natural world? Did any wise man ever tell people that if you want to understand the world, just go out and experiment with your own senses and that's how you'll come to know the world? You think there's no reason why modern people don't like to pray? Well, maybe it's because in the time of the church fathers, children were taught that one of the means, the primary means by which we learn truth is through prayer. And today, prayer doesn't even have a purpose once you're taught that math and experimentation with your senses is all you need to learn what's true. No one's going to pray after they're taught to think like that. No one's going to care what the Pope says, or what the bishops say, or what the Catechism says, or what the Bible says. Because these aren't science textbooks. These aren't calculators and math textbooks. These books are not the way that we learn what's true. We learn what's true in the science lab. We learn what's true in our math classroom, with our calculator, and with our microscope, with our telescope. That's how we learn what's true. Not by faith, not by reason, but by scientific experimentation, which is the new method that in the 1600s successfully freed European culture from the grip of scholastic philosophy. And that education, which is false education, which leads to no prayer, no conception of any sacramental religion, no recognition of a priesthood, no recognition of government authority, no recognition of parental authority, no recognition of divine revelation, no recognition of the, the value and excellence of celibacy and religious vocations. That culture produced by the scientific method, which is much broader than simply learning how to conduct an experiment in a science class, which again is part of the deception 
telling us that this is just about science. The results of the scientific method are so abundant and the, the effect of this deception so successful that we find the Catholics, even the Catholic homeschoolers, acting as the promoters and mouthpieces of the philosophy and system of learning that undermined and overthrew everything that the Catholic Church and the saints established in medieval Europe. The Catholic schools and homeschooling publishers and homeschooling parents are the ones promoting the system of learning, the method of learning that is the cause of the fall of Catholicism in modern society, the cause of the vocations crisis. The same people who say that they're raising saints are teaching their children the system of learning that will ensure that they have no interest in religious vocations and think in no way like the saints. I think I've made this case strong enough. And if you've listened an hour now into this talk, God bless you. The question which I faced in 2008 when I came to really see and understand all of this as I was working in a modern school. The question is, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? We don't simply get rid of the secular science book and look for a quote-unquote Catholic science book. We don't get rid of the modern math book and look for a quote-unquote Christian math book. The problem is much deeper than that. The source of the problem is much older than turning back the clock to the 1960s or the 40s or the 20s or the 1800s. We have to turn the clock back to the 14 and 1500s. And as crazy as that sounds, all I'm going to say to you is look at the results. You can argue with me and say you think it's ridiculous for us to go back to the quote-unquote dark ages, but where is that language coming from? Where did you learn to talk like that? About the, the, about the generations where the saints, the most famous saints of the church, lived and taught and influenced. Where have you learned to talk about that period of history as some kind of backwards age of darkness? You have to examine your own thoughts. How do you explain the lack of interest in religious vocations? How do you explain the falling away of millions and millions of Catholics? How do you explain these things? Why will you refuse to look at the actual cause and see how clear and simple it is? The solution is not simple because it takes a great amount of virtue and courage and patience to turn around and go back, like C.S. Lewis said, go back to the right road. But it's the only option. And as crazy as the things may sound that I say, this is why I tell you the classical liberal arts and the classical liberal arts academy is the only place where you can find the system of learning taught and studied by the saints. And this is why, as I said at the opening of this talk, while I don't normally do this, because I'm usually responding to specific questions, I'm going to be very blunt and say, Catholics need to study in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. It's the only place where the Classical Liberal Arts are being restored. We need the support of Catholic families 
coming in and using the program, helping us to improve it by our experience going through it and working through it, figuring out how to promote it and spread it using modern media, using the internet, using our phones and computers and social media to promote a renewal of true Catholic education. We need support from families who come and use it. We need students to grow up who know it. We need students to come and learn and become teachers. We need students who can learn and, and help us with the work of research and publishing and teaching. We need financial support. We can't have the financial resources of Catholic families being poured into modern curriculums that's just going nowhere when the work of restoring the classical liberal arts requires so much help. We need to be able to hire people to help. We need to be able to pay for resources to publish and teach the classical liberal arts. We can't afford to have people tip the hat to the mission of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy and then go and give all of their support to programs that are actually the cause of the crises in modern Catholic culture. The deception is so strong and subtle that it's hard to admit. And I know people get angry at me when I talk about these things because they think I'm just picking on fellow Catholics. But I'm not. You haven't heard me say anything about anyone personally. You've heard no personal attacks. You've heard a very specific, objective argument. You've heard a principled criticism with explanation of the history, the philosophy, and I've even explained the truth of what I'm saying with the proof of the results, which you know to be true. What's the, what's the other solution? I'm telling you that restoring the classical liberal arts curriculum, getting our children back in classical liberal arts studies will change this in one generation. I've had students come and study with me who are now in seminary because they learned within a few years the truth and they were easily led to see the purpose of religious life, the importance of religious locations. I had 10 boys study with me in a private boarding arrangement, and at least three of them have gone on to seminary. Do you think that that's just good luck? It's not good luck. And if the other boys who were with me had more support, and the teaching that I gave them wasn't undermined by criticism and mockery from modern Catholics, there would have been more of those boys in religious vocations but they were discouraged by other Catholics questioning the nature of their studies and asking them why they weren't focused on math and science or worried about college admission and future careers. And those worldly distractions and anxieties cost those boys the opportunity to serve God in religious vocations. The same thing is happening to hundreds of thousands of Catholic children today. They're being pressured with questions about science and math and college admission and work and marriage, and none of those things are necessary for any one of those Catholic children. What Jesus says to those children is, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you. This idea that man needs to find a place in the world, to find a place in a secular workforce, to have a college degree, to find a partner and get married and have children, these things are completely false. No Catholic needs to do these things. 
What Catholics are called to by God is God himself. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. The saints are models for us of what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. We can't talk about saints and claim to admire the saints and then do and teach the opposite of everything that they did and taught. If we're going to raise saints, if we're going to raise religious vocations, we have to start with the classical liberal arts, just like the saints did. And when we do, as I said, we will see a change in one generation. And the world will not be able to resist the fruits that are produced when Catholic children begin studying the classical liberal arts again. We'll see the results in one generation. These are strong words. I make very bold claims. But I ask you to consider what I say. And judge for yourself. If you can judge honestly, without prejudice, without stubbornness, if you can judge honestly and freely what I say, I believe that you know it's the truth. And that's why I say, not as a sales pitch, not in any kind of selfish ambition, but in Christian truth, Catholic children need to study in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. It's the only place teaching the Classical Liberal Arts in our generation. And I invite you to contact me and get started. You can start for free. It has nothing to do with money. If you don't have money, you can study for free forever. What matters is Catholic children have to learn the classical liberal arts. So please, hear my case for the ancient learning and come and get started in the classical liberal arts academy. Even if you're an adult, come and get started and study the classical liberal arts. Watch my other video or talk where I explain it. It's never too late to seek wisdom. You need to get started today. Please. Listen to this talk, share it with your friends, subscribe to the YouTube channel because I'll continue explaining more and more and help you to understand these things. And I'll respond to questions that I receive day by day. But please, help us to research, restore, publish, and teach the classical liberal arts because we can change these things and we can restore Catholic learning, religious vocations, and true Catholic faith in a single generation as soon as we return to the classical liberal arts and the study of scholastic philosophy. Let's get started. Come and join us at classicalliberalarts.com. God bless.